Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study. In this series of Bible studies, we'll be taking a closer look at the Bible's evidence for the completion of the prolonged Judgment Day and the end of the world occurring in the year 2033. And now here's your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study that is looking at the biblical evidence for the end in the year 2033. This is study number 49. And we're going to pick right up where we were last time. We were in Matthew 24, and we, we began looking at Jude, Christ coming, ten thousands of his saints, which, uh, and, and that had to do with Enoch, who prophesied that, in case you missed the last study, and, and we're still um, on Enoch. Um, looking at what we can learn. Well, that led us to the idea of God revealing his judgment at the time of the end through his word, the Bible. And I uh, mentioned that God did this very thing when judgment began at the house of God, the corporate church. The Lord revealed from Scripture that, that it was the time that um, the church age was over and the Spirit of God had left and Satan's Spirit had entered in and so forth. And now we were in Matthew 24, and in verse 15, it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. As soon as someone reads this and starts talking about some historical thing, I don't care what it is, uh, outside the Bible, and they're, they're you know, reading Josephus, or they're talking about the Romans destroying um, uh, 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 Judah or Israel in 70 AD, and they are lost, they're off course, and they don't have um, any un idea of how to find truth. We always stay in the Bible. In the Bible, you have to define the terms, the words the Bible uses by the Bible. You don't look out and say, oh yeah, now this emperor, he did something with sacrifices, and, and that's the abomination of desolation, and, and it's all extra sources, uh, material, secular sources, historical sources. Forget it. Forget it. it, it uh, just take a look at the church if you want reason why you should forget it. Does the church have wisdom today? Is, is the church uh, wise and understanding and following the, the things of God, and are they continuously learning more and more truth, which ought to be the case, or have the best of the churches, and, and sadly at this time that's not saying much, uh, we would say the Reformed churches, uh, although I don't know if that's true, but that's um, what many uh, seem to think. The best of the churches was their high watermark for wisdom and knowledge and understanding four or five hundred years ago in the time of the Reformation, and that's it. They, they learned from the Reformers, their churches were founded, and, and they became the foundation stone, not Christ. Christ, the Word. It should be the Word of God, the Bible. But it's their confession, it's their creed, it's their re favorite reformers' particular uh, theological understanding, and, and this is uh, really um, their gospel, and, and, and they don't budge for the most part. They, they uphold it, they uphold it, and when the Bible comes along and says, you know, um, that thing you have written in your confession is wrong— and here's the verses to show it, uh, yeah, well, try being a pastor within that denomination who's teaching that way to the congregation. He'll get reported, he'll go before councils. Um, uh, maybe you might want to go um, find another church that's more fitting to your beliefs. And, and if you go to the other church, they have their own set of beliefs and doctrines, that they're fixed in, and you better adhere, you, you, you better submit to the church. Thank God, God has settled this whole thing, remedied it 
remedied it for the sake of his people at the time of the end. We have a lot of things that afflict us, a lot of grievous things going on in the world, but it is not the church. We're no longer under the restraints of often natural-minded men who had rose to positions of power because the whole church, for the most part, was full of natural-minded men, way more tares than we, even during the church age, and they rose up into the ranks, and they got to determine the, um, uh, the, the particular gospel for that congregation and, and the doctrines that were to be followed. And it, well, now we as God's people, we're out, we're out. And this passage here in Matthew 24 is one of the big reasons why we left. Again, Matthew 24, G the disciples asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Again, nothing to do with 70 AD. Today, today our time is the end of the world. When you therefore shall see. Now just compare that with Ephesians, the word see. Ephesians chapter 1 in Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Eyes of understanding. Understanding, and I'm pointing to the mind, but it's not really the gray matter. It's the spirit. It's the soul. It, it It's... Um, the understanding of truth. It's the ears God gives to his elect people to hear Christ's voice. They, they do not follow the voice of another. We, we have that um, wonderful gift of discernment often. Sometimes, yeah, for a little while we might follow someone teaching a lie, but normally there's discomfort uncomfortableness to some degree, and it, it just, you know, the ear tries words like the mouth tastes meat, and something not right, like when you take a bite of something, it, it, it doesn't taste good, and, and we listen, we, we listen to the teaching of an individual, and uh, no, that's off, that's off, and then you listen to the teaching of another individual who is following God's own process or methodology to arrive at truth, comparing spiritual with spiritual, the Holy Ghost teaches when it's done properly, faithfully, then yes, you, you hear the words of the man, because, you know, that's how God works, and he, he uses, um, you know, feeble men with, or with feet of clay, and, and that's absolutely necessary, but you have to listen to what the man's saying as far as the Bible, the scriptures he's going to, the statements he's making regarding them, the proof. Is he going here and there? And, and, uh, and, and are the conclusions, the statements he's making, harmonizing with all of the Bible? See, it's normally when our ear is... Um, trying words like the mouth tastes meat, that that there's, um, no, that doesn't sound right, when there's a failure to harmonize. It, studying the Bible, th this is a, 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 you know, a blessing that God has built in to Bible study. Once the Bible student learns this is part of the Lord's own methodology for coming to truth, that it's a biblical principle. You have to fit the thing that's being said, the doctrine that's being taught, with everything else in the Bible. If there is another scripture somewhere that disagrees, you have to find agreement. You have to find agreement, and sometimes um, you won't, and there'll be a second scripture that disagrees, and a third, because your understanding is wrong. And it's, it's basically like pieces of a puzzle. Everything must fit. What happens if, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to force 
a, um, a puzzle piece into a place. It bends the edges and and uh, doesn't look right. There's no smoothness. There's no consistency with the rest of the puzzle. That's the ability the, uh, to discern that the Lord has given his people. A wise man's heart discerneth time and judgment. Well, that's the eyes of understanding that um, that Christ uh, grants us. And I'll, I'll go to another verse in, in uh, Luke. In Luke chapter 24, uh, it says, and uh, let's see, is Luke 24 the right chapter? Um, no. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Luke 24, Luke 24, uh, verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. Basically, that is saying he opened their eyes. He opened their eyes, and, and that's why Jesus performed miracles of giving sight to the blind to illustrate salvation because when we're in our uh we're spiritually dead in sin uh we we have no spiritual sight we have no understanding of the bible that's why um that's the reason when you speak uh you can speak to anyone in the world and, and often now in the church or speak to a muslim or speak to any person who who uh is unsaved and start discussing the bible and you're going to hear some far out things. Uh, and uh, they, they have little to no actual understanding of the Word of God because they're spiritually blind. And, and, and in salvation, God opens our eyes in one sense, immediately and forever, in simply being born again, but there is also a process over the course of our Christian life where we're growing in grace and in the knowledge of God, in understanding, where we're beginning to put pieces of the puzzle together, and, and it's beginning to fit. And at the time of the end, this is the revelation of God's righteous judgment that is putting the um, the uh, end time passages together for us. So they're beginning to harmonize and come together, and we're starting to see the whole picture, the whole plan of God for these things. Okay, want to finally finish this. Matthew 24. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Uh, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Judea here is a picture. It's a type and a figure. It's a parabolic statement that Christ is making. He is not referring to uh, literal Judah nor literal mountains, because this has to do with the end of time. And the people of God are scattered to the four nations, or four winds. We're, we're not in Judah. There, there could be a handful of elect over in the land of Israel today, but the vast, overwhelming vast majority of elect who are spiritual Jews are again in, in all the nations. They're in all the nations, and 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 so um, th this is why you know again natural-minded theologians, natural-minded theologians write their commentaries, and and they say, well, obvious, you know, this is Judah, and there are mountains round about Judah, and and then they go in. Oh, the Romans came. 
the Romans came and and um, and some of the Jews fled Judah uh, under Roman persecution and went to the mountains and they think they found uh, biblical truth and th th they haven't found anything. They haven't found anything. They've only served to um, cloud their eyes in the eyes of their readers. A a again, because it, it all stems from the holy place, their, their, their mindset. It, it's very easy for God to fool the unsaved. And, and uh, yes, God does write the Bible to, uh, to hide truth from the eyes of the wicked. And just look at, um, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, feelers out in this scripture and that scripture. So uh, you can turn to Matthew 13, start in verse 11. The disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And then Jesus answered, because um, it is given unto you to know the mysteries. Mysteries are hidden things to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to them, it is not given. Not given. Which means the mysteries of the kingdom of God will remain mysteries to them. And they, they don't know that Christ is the word. Just read John 1. I'm not making that up. John 1, 1, in the word was the beginning, the word was God. John 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh. In, in the entire time of his life, he, he's walking around like a living Bible. He's the Word everywhere he goes. And he taught people constantly. He was teaching. And he taught in what method? Plain, literal, historical, grammatical method? Is that the method? No. No. He spoke in parables, and without a parable, he did not speak. Why? Why did God, in his, only, in his only opportunity in the flesh uh, to teach, why did God always teach in parables? Kind of curious, isn't it? If it's true what the churches say, that you have to look for the plain, literal, historical, grammatical method of interpret and, and interpret the Bible along those lines. Why didn't Jesus teach that way? Why did he say the kingdom of heaven is like and, and proceed to speak a parable? Why did he say to uh, uh, the apostles, the disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees? And they immediately thought natural. Oh, well, it's because we've taken no bread. And then he goes on to say, no, no. And uh, the, the, um, the leaven has to do with doctrine. Doctrine. It was a spiritual understanding of leaven, and he did not forewarn them. He, he didn't use any kind of opening line like the kingdom of heaven is like, or I'm about to speak in a parable. He just simply, they're, they're living their lives. He's walking among them, and he made this statement, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and anyone who thinks leaven, who thinks the physical thing that's being referenced, is wrong. Wrong, because Christ spoke in parables. Without a parable, he did not speak. And, uh, you know, we can give abundance of biblical evidence and proof to show this, but, uh, you know, at this point, uh, it, it's elementary for the elect children of God. It's nothing new to us. Th this is how you understand the Bible. If you want to understand the Bible, if you want to stay in darkness, in ignorance of mind, and lack right knowledge of the things of God, yeah, keep applying the church principle that has, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I was going to be a little sarcastic and say, serve them so well. Uh, because it hasn't served them well at all. It hasn't served them well at all. They, they've walked off a cliff. But anyway, <clears throat> um, here in Matthew 24, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Judea is a type and a figure. It's a proverb. It's a proverb that represents the church. 
just like the holy place, abomination of desolation, the holy place. The holy place is the church. Well, prove it. Prove it. How do you know that's a proverb? And, well, what I was just saying about Jesus and speaking in parables, but if you want a little more verification, go to 1 Kings chapter 9, and we read in verse 6, But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye are your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. Did God cut off Israel? Yes, he rent the veil of the temple in twain. Read Romans chapter 11. He, he cut off the natural branches and and he graft in the Gentiles, and, and then he, he warned the Gentiles, look what I've done to the natural branches, and if I've done that to the natural branches, uh, don't be high-minded but fear, for I can do it to you. So there's a direct warning to the church, you better be faithful. The church does not stand by grace. Individuals stand by grace. God, for by grace are ye saved as an individual those that the Lord has saved. It's not uh, the Presbyterians stand by grace collectively, or the uh, Lutherans, or the Episcopalians, or the Catholics, or anybody else. The church institution is an institution that had to do good works, faithful works, that is, obey the Word of God. They had to follow the teachings of the Bible, and if they veer off course as they have done, then God will do to them what he did to Israel before them, and, and actually, it, it's not future tense, it's already done. God has done this, he has ended the church age, and cut off um, the churches and congregations of the world in a similar way. But as far as Matthew 24 is concerned, Israel, because the Lord judged them, they ceased to be his holy people because of their spiritual idolatry, their unfaithfulness, they became a proverb. They became a proverb, so when we read house of God in the New Testament, when we read Judah, and especially in Matthew 24, referring to the time of the end, you better look for the proverbial meaning, the spiritual meaning of that. Well, um, we're, we're, we're going to uh, close um, this study at this point. Uh, Lord willing, when we get together in our next study, uh, we're, we're going to um, you know, stay on this trail uh, of God revealing the judgment, revealing his wrath, the 10,000 saints, getting back to Enoch. We'll, we'll come back to Enoch, Lord willing, um, uh, in, in, down the line, <laughs> down the line a little bit. Thank you for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies and information, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. Until our next Bible study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.